exploring high density fiber connector solutions for next gen switches. We've seen some of these terabit class switches on display earlier this year at OFC and at ECOC. The design specs from major network silicon providers have been coming out for CPO connectivity. And in this series of webinars, we've talked about many of the technical and energy saving features of these designs. So in this discussion today, we'll delve into evolving solutions for high density connectors and fibers feeding into these switches. So this is the 13th in the series of webinars presented by Kobo, the Consortium for Onboard Optics, and sponsored by DuPont Silicon Valley Technology Center. Our webinar today is going to last one hour. First, we'll hear from Brent Cozy, who is Advanced Fiber R&D Engineer at Panduit. And then we'll hear a joint presentation from Yi Sun, who is a distinguished member of the technical staff at OFS, and her colleague Mabu Chaudhry, who is Senior Design R&D Manager. After the presentations, we should have plenty of time for Q&A, so your questions are definitely welcome. Please use the Q&A uh, function um, below. Um, at the, uh, I'll read through these questions and ask them anonymously. Uh, if we don't get to all of the questions, our presenters will get back to you as they can. And if you could please, in your question, um, ask if it's directed to Bulent or E or uh, Mabud. So with that, let's get started. Uh, Blunt, the floor is now all yours. So I'm a, a member of our corporate R&D uh, fiber research team. We've been working on optical fiber, multi-mode and single-mode fiber measurements, connectors, some innovative ideas for connectivity and interface inspection and, and things like this. So I'd like to um, basically <clears throat> present to you uh, some connectors uh, high, you know, high density next, gen next generation connector ideas from the perspective of um, structured cabling, which is you know, what we kind of focus on. So um, the motivation of this uh, talk, uh, as uh, Jim already alluded to, we have very high ASIC, uh, you know, radix count switches that's available. I am so sorry, I forgot to <laughs> turn on the video. Um, so as Jim alluded to, we have um, some very high speed, high radix count switches available and um, based on CPO and, and onboard optics. And um, recently machine to machine uh, traffic, east-west traffic make, make up as much as 70% of total traffic in data centers, driving fast growing ma market for switches and optical links. So this was reported in a Cisco annual report from 2020. Um, so there was a 51.2 uh, a terabit per second capacity switch uh, from Broadcom recently called Tomahawk. And this can you know, enable a 512, 100 gigabit per second, 128, 400 gigabit per second, and 64, 800 gigabit, gigabit per second ports. I mean, you can see this is very dense a number of ports that we're talking about. And uh, very high power consumption if you're using pluggable optics um, and high attenuation electrical lanes, again, when the pluggable optics are used. So that's where you know, onboard optics and co-package optics ideas, of course, they, they've been, they, they started because of those needs to address the, um, the high power consumption and, and high density. So, OBO and CPO can enable you know, this, these power efficient links. Efficient high density connectivity is needed for onboard and switch external connections, servers to switches. And we could use structured cabling guidelines and best practices for, for the whole network. In this webcast, we will review internal and external connectivity options of next generation switches based on onboard optics and co-package optics. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, 
So I wanted to first take a, a, a few minutes to discuss, to sort of remember, uh, remind us or remember the history of uh, the consortium for onboard optics and co-package optics and, and, and so on. So first I wanted to look at the consortium of, uh, consortium of, of onboard optics uh, and the onboard optics the specification that they developed. So the idea of onboard optics is, is not new. It, Actually, before you know, pluggables in the late 1990s, basically everything was onboard optics. You know, these, uh, you know, um, Intel, IBM, or other other you know companies, AT&T, they were making you know optical uh, systems, optical communication systems, um, on the board. They they've been putting the, the optics on the board, so there was no pl uh, pluggables. But this is proprietary systems, and there was no standards-based approach before Cobo. And actually, there, there was one of the reasons was uh, there was Cobo was established. Recently, electrical and optical densities and increase in power consumption, which means increased cooling needs for high-speed pluggable modules, created some engineering challenges. And to address these challenges, Cobo was formed to establish a new ecosystem of onboard optics. Cobo's specification was approved in December 2018 for eight and 16 lane versions of the one by 400 and two by 400 applications. And on my slide here, I, I show a couple of pictures to, uh, to give examples. On the uh, upper right, we have uh, the, <clears throat> the logical uh, a drawing of a, what an onboard optics engine would look like. And in the specification, there is two times 400 uh, integrated and two times 400 separate versions of these as well. And on the, uh, at the bottom, on the right, is the connectivity that would be needed, either uh, connectorized or pigtailed. And on the, on the panel, uh, we would call the MDI based, uh, based on <coughs> The media dependent interface based on article description. And at the bottom uh, on the left is uh, a, an actual picture that shows what it would look like uh, when it's implemented. So this OBO IC would be a separate integrated circuit, separate module with low and high speed connectivity. And again, the, the, connect, the optical fiber or op optical connectivity to the board would be either pigtailed or connectorized. So after um, the finishing of the OBIS specification, Kobo started working on co-package optics. This was a white paper, white paper that they developed and it was recently published where they described implementation guidelines and options, uh, detailed options for co-package optics. There was also a discussion uh, on external laser, which is an added option, uh, which is also discussed in uh, Optical Networking Forum, the CPO option. So this requires some additional connectivity and especially it, it may require a polarization maintaining you know, fiber. In addition to COBO, uh, recently Opt Optical Internet Networking Forum, OIF, also started a project on this. And this is a 32 terabit per second core package uh, optics module for intradata center switching applications. And the idea is to have 100 gig electrical lanes, 32 lanes, and to support 400 G base FR4 and 400 G base DR4, also to be backward compatible. So, um, so when you look at these, um, uh, you're talking about for the uh, the FR4, it's 256 fibers that will they will go into this uh, this switch, and for DR4, using FR4 using you know. A, a, a wavelength division multiplex and four wavelengths. DR4, a parallel, a single, a parallel lanes, they would require four times, which is you know, 1,024 lanes. So I, on the, on the right-hand side, I uh, copied a picture from the, this web, a white paper, Cobo white paper, to show what it would look like. There's the ASIC in the middle, and then your optical engines uh, would be sitting at, in, in, at about the same, uh, same PCB. And then you would have these, uh, you know, optical fibers that go into the the faceplate. 
Um, the picture on the on the left shows two different options to do this. Uh, and actually, one, one of them is called package optics. The other one is also called near package optics or using an interposer. And so in, with the interposer, rather than putting it, putting the optical modules on the same PCB, you put it a, very, a little bit away, and then there is another electronic circuit interposer to, uh, to make the connection. And you can tell the, uh, the, the attenuation difference, 7 dB channel loss versus 12 dB channel loss through the interposer. But this could be useful um, depending on, on the design criteria. So now I would like to, again, compare um, pluggable onboard optics and CPO, CPO options in terms of technology, applicability, and, um, and, and some others like serviceability uh, and, and stuff like that. So um, first of all, let's, let's go through this very quickly, some of the, the key ones. So signaling, they, you know, they use the same signaling. So we, we the original 400, the original OBO uh, was based on 56 gig, uh, and now we have 112 gig electrical lanes available. So this is actually the OIF is based on 112 uh, uh, electrical lanes using. In, uh, uh, so and, and there is now obviously that they're working on the uh, higher speeds as well. So for target reach. Uh, the plug pluggables obviously are very flexible. You know, you could have different versions of these. Um, DR, uh, FR, you know, there's multi-mode versions, single-mode versions. So to address different different reaches, short reach, you know, data center, hyperscale data center, you know, intra data center, I mean, inter data, data center. Um, for uh, OBO and CPO, we're looking at intra data center applications only. For optical uh, formats, this is actually basically we could say this is agnostic OBO and CPO because you could you could uh, implement these on any of these. Right now, for instance, OIF is working on the DR4 and FR4 applications specifically. Obviously, they're not doing SR4, SR8, but I'm going to sort of uh, also mention this later. But we can include SR4 and SR8 uh, there as well. Um, so connect the locations, obviously, that's the, the, the design of onboard and the co-package. Uh, pluggables are you know, at, the, um, at the plane, uh, module plane, and the other ones are on, on the module. So the, the key issues that needs to be addressed, engineering challenges are related with manufacturability, capability, serviceability, you know, module standardization and, um, you know, um, the uh, failure uh, or, or I guess, uh, reliability of these modules. So these, these are some, uh, some topics that are uh, very relevant to OBO and, and CPO. Um, um, so for pluggables, I mean, obviously it's a very mature market. So we've been working on the, making these since 1990s. And um, uh, but um, um, and it's very very mature market. Um, so for uh, for uh, Obo, um, it is the, the module is outside of the ASIC, so it doesn't depend on photonic integration. So there's some benefit there. And for CPO, it's actually on the module piece, you know, of the ASIC, so that requires uh, integration. Uh, for serviceability, as I mentioned, this is a big challenge for, especially for CPO, because you're uh, on the ASIC and that's a very high, you know, uh, uh, that's a very uh, expensive equipment, and um, and it's difficult to uh, to to work in, in in that environment to you know if there's any problem. Um, uh, for for pluggables, that's not a problem. You just you know replace the module. Um, for standardization, um, obviously, OBO has been, you know, working on standardizing the onboard optics. Um, 
but for uh, for pluggables, um, I, I just put heavier IEEE. Um, but we, you know, we can talk about uh, uh, fiber channel uh, MSAs um, uh, for for the standardization as well. Um, so, uh, for the reliability, the module failure, pluggables is of course it's easy to uh, replace, and uh, for the CPO it will be very difficult to replace, and a you know complete. A module replacement might be required in that case. So um, now I wanted to talk about how we integrate uh, or how we take our structured cabling ideas and um, uh, best practices and and look at this CPO and OBO from that perspective. So I, on the left, I have three different cases that that I uh, that I show. Um, a, uh, for the uh, this is for CPO connectivity where you have a pigtailed and you have a connector in the middle and a connector at on on the board, uh, but and then you have the uh, the optical plane uh, where you would have your connectivity to the structured cabling. So over CPO uh, uh, internal connectivity creates a risk and challenge for serviceability. Very high density of short pigtails, difficulty cleaning, inspecting, difficulty of fusion splicing. Um, whenever you know, there's a problem with, with these internal uh, fibers, um, that's why it's recommended to use structured cabling like patch cores, patch panels, and um, conversion and, and 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 mesh type uh, mesh cassettes for converting between you know, 16, 12 fiber uh, suction cabling connectivity. And of course, depending on FR4, DR4 application, you would have different number of uh, fibers. Excuse me. Different number of fibers going into the, into the module. So you need to have some, you need to adjust the number of fibers, that, you know, maybe some breakout scenarios. So it would be better to do these um, Using the structured cabling best practices, as I said, you know, page panels and, and things like this. So, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about this um, mid-plane connector, the second option in the middle, and why that could be a, a good idea. So, if you look at this picture here, um, uh, you, if if you look at the uh, the connection for a CPO of to the ASIC. You find out that you may have to have some uh, different lengths of pigtails uh, of, of uh, fibers, and um, for installation that could cause some trouble. And um, to be able to, uh, it, so there may be some breaks of the fibers, uh, you know, when, during the installation. So to be able to solve this problem, an idea is to have a mid, you know, mid uh, mid board connector, uh, so we can. We can have um, uh, at least one well, uh, connection point where we can manage these uh, these fibers in a better way for uh, for uh, reliability. So now let's go to these uh, connectors that the high high density connectors that we have right now that we could use. There have been some new innovative dense fiber optic connectors recently from multiple manufacturers. Most are not standard based yet. So some of them I list here, um, uh, MXC, that's expanded beam, MMC, um, uh, that's from uh, US Connect, SNMT, that's another uh, it's dense, you know, very, very small form factor uh, connectors. And I, I put here some pictures from their website on the right to kind of show how, it co how they compare to regular, you know, M MTP, MTP ferrule in, in size. So even though uh, they are not standardized, they need to comply with connected performance standards, such as from IEC and TIA. Um, uh, so insertion loss is obviously very significant because of these high speed applications, we're, we're working with some limited power budget and not just insertion loss, but the optical return loss and reflectance are also important because we're mostly talking about single mode applications, the R4, FR4. So these could you know, cause multi interference and you know 
the relative intensity noise for the, uh, the, the laser. Again, on the right here on the pictures, I show examples um, uh, from uh, two major vendors that are that have been very active on working on the, these, and um, the uh, MMC and, and SNMT connectors from US Connect and uh, and Senko. And um, you can tell it's almost one third of the uh, actual uh, you know. Uh, faceplate size that, that you would need with these very high speed very high you know high density connectors you can t the, the pictures on the on the bottom is showing how many connectors you could put on a one RG unit with 1152 fibers so here i list um uh, i have a list of uh, you know the connectors uh, Starting from LC and uh, some duplex connectors, MPO 12 and 16, and, and these uh, high, high density uh, connectors to kind of show, uh, first of all, how many of these we can fit on, um, on a one RU unit um, and how many fibers, uh, like for the, in the two applications, 400 gig DR4 and the FR4 applications, uh, 1024 for DR4 and 256 for FR4 applications. Um, and um, and on the on the right, I also show which ones you know the ones that are not standardized. You can you can see most of these uh, you know duplex connectors MPO12 are standardized MPO2432, but um, the newer ones they are not standardized. Yet. So um, even for MP, MPO12, you know we might have some issue with fitting them on on a single uh, one RU unit for a DR4 application, for instance. That's that's the point I was trying to make here. Okay, so um, now I wanted to talk about some of the installation issues for multi-fiber connector, high-density connectors. Um, starting with, um, and, and I'm, I wanted to talk about the end-phase cleanliness problem. So um, fiber optic connectors are very sensitive to end-phase cleanliness, obviously, that you know causes some insertion loss, return loss, performance issues. And especially for uh, single mode fibers, uh, this is even worse. Um, and this is a big, bigger problem for you know uh, <clears throat> multi-fiber connect connectors. Um, so our industry has established some best practices, some cleaning methods, um, and most connector manufacturers they did a great job of you know providing a connector out of package that that has minimal uh, problems with the end phase. But we think there are some improvements that can be done. And one of them is uh, a, a larger field of view imaging system in, in production. So on the right-hand side here, I show um, an upper picture, upper, uh, upper right picture shows a normal, actually it's a pretty, uh, uh, pretty good commercially available end phase inspection tool that shows all of the fibers. But it, and at the bottom, of that is a system that we've developed in-house here at Tandut, where we have a much larger field of view. And so the reason for this would be, in case uh, there may there are some debris or dust or something in an area where the imaging system couldn't allow, couldn't see, and then this was uh, shipped, that uh, that dust or that debris can uh, travel to the middle of you know of the connector and uh, and. Uh, contaminate the fibers. So this would be a good way to make sure uh, to to uh, to imp to improve the end phase cleanliness and um, in production. So at the bottom, I took some pictures from a very recent paper uh, that was presented in IWCS that sort of shows uh, the impact of end phase cleanliness on insertion loss. You have the the, uh, the connectors with the dust and after cleaning, and in the, uh, the insertion loss delta IL, the delta change. Z uh, let's look at the, the one in the middle, dust effect of dust. So zero means it was a clean connector, and that's the attenuation of. And these different colors show different uh, cumulative distributions for a you know a, a large number of sort of connectors. And so it's very very small attenuation difference of x is zero obviously at the beginning, and when you and and the the point number one is when after you know after um, 
there's some dust or dirt on these connectors. And then two, three, four is after they're clean. So you can, the point I, was, I wanted to make is, even if you clean the dirt and dust or, or the debris, not, uh, not always go completely away. So there's still some remnants there. That's why it's important uh, at the production to make this, uh, to make it very clear. Um, so regarding the end phase cleanliness, there is one, uh, you know, a connector type that could help that's expanded beam and air gap connectors. And I wanted to actually kind of mention about that as well. Um, um, so generally expanded beam connectors have higher insertion loss compared to traditional connectors. So that's, that's why one of the reasons why, you know, it took some time for these connectors uh, to come into picture. But right now, uh, there are a couple of companies that are developing these. And the, although these are not standardized, uh, they, you know, they are being offered and they could be used for onboard optics and CPU applications, especially for the connectors that's on the board uh, because, because of the area, you know, um, and because there is really no standards, you know, of those connectors there. Uh, so the, and, and the, um, and the directionality of the connectors, the, the adapters should have to be very small. So these connectors could be a good uh, application there. Another innovative connector design is using air gaps. That's also, uh, and then I show one of the examples here, air MT from, uh, um, I believe this is from US uh, uh, Senko. Um, so one issue with these type of, uh, Expanded beam and air gap connectors is, is obviously they're complex connectors compared to physical contact, and so manufacturing uh, could be a challenge, uh, you know, because of their uh, uh, complexity, and also they could be more expensive compared to PC connectors. So um, before I finish, I wanted to ask a question: um, opportunities for multi-mode fiber or multi-mode waveguides for onboard optics. So in principle, the multi-mode fiber was not left out of, you know, over specification. Um, but most of the work has been on, has been using silicon photonics and single mode fiber. And the recent OIF specifically uh, targeted DR4 and FR4 single mode applications. So what we think is um, SMF being more, single mode fiber being more susceptible or single mode fiber connectors, most, more susceptible to connected end phase contamination. Um, are there opportunities to use multi-mode fiber or multi-mode waveguides even for, uh, for short reaches, like reaches you know, below 100 meters, um, you know, so switch to server links, for instance. I mean, Vixel uh, is more efficient and it has, been demonst it has demonstrated robustness, and it, especially for contamination and misalignments because of the multi-mode fiber, 50 micron diameter. And obviously, single-mode fiber is more uh, susceptible. And, um, and expanded beam connectors, you know, might need to be needed, but this may not be needed for multi-mode. So this, this is a question, should multi-mode be considered? With, uh, related with that, I just wanted to uh, mention this. I don't want to go into detail, but this is a project going on in OBO, uh, multi-mode wave-wide interconnect uh, system, MWIS. And here, basically, we're trying to replace the copper wires with uh, you know, optical waveguide multi-mode waveguide and uh, to, to address, uh, again, some of these problems. And I, I also have here some examples of some co a contribution from uh, our Pandu team on, um, on the modeling of, these, of the waveguide that we're considering and um, looking at um, you know, the attenuation, expected attenuation that might be de depending on the material and the roughness of the material. So just, I don't, I don't want to give detail, but this is just another project that's been going on. So in summary, pluggable optical module ecosystem uh, based on IEEE and MSAs has been in place for decades, providing flexible and serviceable high-speed switch optical connectivity. As data rates increase beyond 100 gigabit per second per electric lane, it becomes challenging to connect the ASIC to pluggable module due to port density, power consumption, and thermal limitations. So. Onboard optics and co-package optics can address these problems by bringing you know, a high bandwidth optical connections very close to the switch ASICs and by increasing the uh, faceplate density. 
So we have reviewed internal and external connected options for CPO and onboard optics, including new non-standard dense connectors, and addressed topics about optical performance, density, reliability, and serviceability, et cetera. Uh, basically, we use of high-density multi-fiber connectors obviously is needed, and we need to benefit from structured cabling best practice, practices, and we need to protect those connectors close to the, the active equipment um, in our installation and, and service. So that's, uh, that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I'd like to thank uh, our, my team members here, Jose Castro, Rick Pinella, Paul Huang, for their feedback, and also OFS team, Abud and Yi, uh, as well. And also uh, US Connect uh, reached out to us again, uh, also for, uh, for some feedback about uh, the, the dense connectors. I'd like to thank them as well. So um, back to you, Jim. Thank you. Okay, great. So now, now we'll have the presentation from uh, OFS. Uh, so introducing Yi and Mawood. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, um, thank Kobo for the invitation. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening from where you are. Um, you um, just heard from a brilliant, uh, excellent review of the the architecture and of the next generation uh, switches and the high density connector technology. In next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, Mabud and I are happy to share the fiber technology. We start uh, from an overview and then highlight with uh, some examples. As Bulent uh, just mentioned, the onboard optics and the co-packaged optics, those switch at a segment of a very short piece of a fiber inside the switch box between the, the uh, module or the OE chip and the front panel connector connecting to the rest of the data center. And that piece of a fiber can be a pick a tailed or connectorized or pick tailed with a connectorized jumper. And the uh, fiber large, uh, the, the number of fiber can be a very large, uh, uh, quote some numbers here for a switch uh, bandwidth of 51.2 terabits per second, could be uh, 256 fibers uh, uh, for CPO based on FR4. And that number could be uh, over 1,000 uh, if it's based on DR4. And you saw the number of uh, in one RU switch, it could be like up to 3,000 in Bullen's uh, uh, presentation. With that larger amount of fibers inside a, a um, switch box, a narrow space, the routing of the fiber is challenging and that requires some tight bending. For example, of 7.5 millimeter radius at the exit of uh, onboard optics uh, modules. And besides of uh, high density and tight bending, the fiber coupled to the CPO um, OE chip can experience uh, temperature, elevated temperature up to 260 degrees uh, during the socket reflow process. And the CPO can uh, have the option of external laser and external laser has the option for polarization maintaining fiber. So it's a requirement of a high density, tight bending, high temperature polarization maintaining. The question arises for the reliability of the fiber and the optical performance, including loss and um, MPI uh, by refrigerants. So this slide overviews the fiber technologies. Um, the onboard optics, uh, uh, the fiber for onboard optics and the uh, high density plug bolts can choose uh, either the single mode fiber bending sensitive or bend optimized uh, multiple fiber. Um, same applies to co-packaged optics. Uh, the current co-packaged optics 3.2 terabits per second module uh, is based on DR4 and FR4 that's for single mode. But as Bullen just mentioned, multiple VIXO option is not uh, left out. Uh, much mode uh, VIXO platform has the benefit of uh, low power and uh, a better connector tolerance uh, that was well proved in pluggable transceivers and the same benefit can be carried over to the co optics and the onboard optics. 
So let's zoom in the uh, icons on the top left, the bending sensitive single mode of fiber. Here are the diameters of uh, ITU specified um, single mode fibers. Um, the G657A1A2B3, I like to point out OFS um, uh, has um, ultra bending sensitive single mode fiber um, with uh, bending radius. Uh, Specify down to 2.5 millimeter and uh, micro band loss uh, less than 0.2 dB per turn at 1550 nanometer. At the bottom shows the reach of the OM345 fibers. These optimize the multiple fiber uh, with uh, 100 and 400 gig and 800 gigabits per second pixel based Ethernet uh, uh, transceivers. So we can see here the reach supportable by the uh, OM345 fibers uh, are maintained, uh, predict to maintain, it tends to up to 100 meter, uh, up to 800 gigabits per second. I like to point out here is so 100 by that, 400 gig by that, and the 800 gig by that, those are um, wavelengths multiplexing uh, using two wavelengths. And they're also proprietor SWDM4, that's a four wavelengths. So the bending sensitive design fiber and uh, wavelength multiplexing, those are the approach to, to increase the uh, fiber density, optical density. And on top of that, there is also reduced cladding, uh, it's called a thin fiber and the rollable ribbon, that's to increase the, the fiber density inside the cable. And there is a um, specialty fiber uh, with higher numerical patches, smaller mode field diameter uh, for uh, optimized for coupling integrate to PIC. And there are polarization maintaining fibers for external laser. And the, for those fibers, the design feature can be uh, overlapped. The reduced cladding can be bending sensitive single mode fiber or multiple fiber or, or polarization maintaining fiber. And uh, the, both in, uh, the, the rollable ribbon can, uh, the single mode or, or multiple fiber can be put into a rollable ribbon. And on the right are two types of uh, more future looking fiber technologies, multicore fiber and uh, holocore fiber. There are lots of uh, uh, R&D efforts on the multicore fiber. And the holocore fiber is actually commercialized and uh, with a field, uh, field uh, deployment uh, uh, relate to the, regarding to the OBO, that's very small, short reach, um, short length of uh, application, uh, the reliability and splicing those bending sensitive of uh, holocar fiber remain to be uh, addressed. Uh, from here is three slides, I use three slides to touch on the fiber reliability. Fiber reliability is definitely not a new topic. This slide reflect on what lesson we can learn from uh, uh, telecom, datacom, data and uh, fiber to the home uh, can be adapted to the OBO or CPO. Um, first, uh, uh, in past uh, three to four decades, several billion kilometers of optic fibers have been deployed in telecom networks, and uh, it has been proved uh, providing reliable service. And that is um, uh, done by uh, doing a carry a proof test after the fiber draw at a 1% uh, uh, stream to limit the weak point in the fiber. And, um, and then followed by a qualification test for optical performance. And the fiber put in field in the cable were designed to experience service stress only one quarter, one third of that uh, proof test stream. So that's a way to uh, to get um, to warranty extreme uh, low failure rate. And uh, moving to the data center, the fiber can experience the stress, service stress higher than that. Uh, for example, the fiber in the vertical direction in the structure, the cabling several meters uh, experience some self weight, uh, but there are uh, ex um, uh, outstanding studies on this, stress those issues. I quote a uh, um, study back in to, um, 2014 in AWCS. And in that study, uh, about 20,000 pieces of 10 meter fibers 
uh, spanning two years of qualification tests and 45 pieces of uh, half meter fibers agent sample uh, were investigated for mechanical strength and reliability. Um, the key conclusions uh, take away from uh, uh, that study was uh, over a 20 year lifetime and low failure rate below 0.4 FITs under deployment condition. The product condition can be a service stress of uh, 1% stream. So to read for this 0.4 FIT, that can be read as uh, one failure for 10,000 pieces of 100 meter fiber over 20 years. And then for the fiber with the tight bands uh, and um, under tension, both. Uh, those were studied as um, during the kickoff, as a kickoff and uh, uh, through the deployment the fiber to the home. And uh, here I refer to one study back in 2008. On the right shows the schematic and the setup, the image of the, uh, the reliability study. The fiber was uh, put uh, on both a small, uh, diameter, uh, manual, and uh, that's for bending, and uh, apply the tension uh, from the top. And uh, the the key takeaway from that study is um, uh, the fibers um, a, a drop cable can uh, under both tight bands and tension, uh, resulting low failure rate for long service time. So for fiber to home, we know. Uh, there's tight bands like uh, 90 degree in the corner and uh, stables that add both um, bands and attention. So those um, experiences can be adapted to OVO and um, CPO. And then we mentioned at the beginning the fiber uh, not only experienced tight bands, also a harsh environment to elevate the temperature. Um, what's not just summarized here, but it's very interesting. There were studies for uh, multiple fiber under elevated temperature um, for aerospace and um, automotive and uh, sensing applications. Uh, it's not summarized here, but if you're interested, we can provide that uh, in chat or by email. Um, my board gave two presentations last year, uh, cover that pretty well. And what is uh, covered here, two studies uh, uh, for the specialty optic fibers coating. Um, back in 2016, Huang studied uh, 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 the coating uh, performance uh, impact on the fiber reliability and the key uh, finding there is a coating integrity performance, the weak link in the strength degradation of coated fiber under the a harsh environment. We have products that have coatings suitable for various applications, including standard and high temperature polyimide acrylate uh, uh, coat and um, uh, res heat resistant buffers. And in the follow-up study in 2021, um, there's further uh, extensive study for coated fiber uh, under mechanical optical band conditions and in an emulated uh, environment, uh, um, particularly for the reflow soldering process. And the findings there is uh, the fibers um, uh, discolored, uh, but uh, uh, less uh, degradation in nitrogen than in air. And the uh, coated fiber um, shows uh, uh, the, the, you know, the high temperature uh, dual coat is a better choice than a standard uh, uh, dual acrylic coat to use. The table on the right top shows the failure probability over 20 years. And uh, for, you know, with the estimate minimum band radius allowed for three fiber samples studied. And the special fiber uh, with high numeric capacity reduced colliding in a smaller mode field diameter uh, for optimized for PICs in development. And we are happy to, to discuss use case. So COBO recommended two um, cost-effective ways to improve the fiber reliability for tight bending scenarios. One is to double the, the proof test stream to 2% and that to eliminate more weak points and reduce the cladding diameter of the fiber. And here's a figure I uh, put together to, to uh, summarize um, several combinations of the 
fiber cladding diameter and uh, uh, proof test stream, the filler rate and the band radius. The green is um, uh, with uh, doubled uh, proof test strain to 2%. That improved the reduced failure in time by 30 times. And the red is the reduced cladding. And that improves the failure in time by six times. And the reduced cladding uh, reduces less, um, resulting less residue fiber stress. That means better mechanical reliability and also enable smaller form factor for high density solution. However, it uh, uh, brings a challenge on microbending and that uh, is uh, uh, solvable by uh, optimized fiber design profile and uh, coating optimization. Here I highlight uh, uh, reduced cladding thin fiber, a single mode fiber bending sensitive. It is optimized for umbrella optics and pluggable modules uh, with tighter bands. And it's proof test at 2% and has a diameter, cladding diameter of 80 micrometer, uh, has excellent uh, micro band performance, tighter geometric tolerance, and the cutoffs less than 12, 60 nanometer. That means uh, less MPI to both O band and uh, S band um, transmission. And actually, reduced cladding diameter. Uh, Fiber is not um, new. We have a, a whole family of reduced cladding a diameter uh, coupler fiber for various um, applications and uh, build up for experience um, for the reduced dimension fibers um, um, down to coating like 100 micrometer and has options on cutoff coating and proof test. The polarization maintaining fiber um, use a stress rod to lift the, the polarization degeneracy. Um, there are many uh, polarization fiber products that uh, um, cover the application in a wider spectral range, 840 nanometers, 1310, 14 something, and 1550, and uh, also has uh, different uh, fiber dimensions. And here are highlighted two uh, optimized for the OBO type of in the applications when standard uh, uh, dimension uh, with uh, bending sensitive. And the, the key parameters here is the proof test at 2% to improve reliability. It has a tight geometrical tolerance and um, it's available with a high temperature coating again for the reliability improvement. And there's also reduced cladding design it's um, optimized for, for, for the band loss also in tidal geometry and um, those fly loss. And from here, three slides on uh, the multi-core fiber. So multi-core fiber has uh, several cores um, in one single cladding that uh, promise uh, the improved uh, uh, the density by a factor of the equivalent to the core numbers. Here is the single mode uh, multi-core fiber, four cores with the standard uh, uh, glass OD of 125 micrometer that has the benefit of uh, uh, compatibility to use uh, the same optical components and equipment to develop for standard single mode fiber over years. And this is a proof test at uh, 2% of uh, strain, 200 kpi as I that 2% strain. And we carried a uh, system transmission experiment using commercial 400 uh, DR4, FR4, IR4. Um, the signals were coupled to the fibers through a multi-core to single mode fiber fan, fan out. Um, the rich error-free transmission over five kilometer, 10 kilometer were achieved that's uh, uh, rich uh, uh, specify or exceed the, that uh, you know, specified for standard single mode fiber. Um, in, in standards. I have to mention uh, uh, splicing technique were developed to apply uniform heat across the four cores, a fiber that result in a, a world record low spli loss. And here shows a uh, uh, multi-mode multi-core fiber, eight cores arranged in, in, in circular uh, arrangement. And we carried the system uh, Transmission experiment using commercial 400 gig SR 4.2 transceivers. 
and the fiber was in a um, multiple fiber assembly. That means the, uh, the fiber was spliced to a fan fan out in the uh, aggregated 800 gigabits per second transmission over the echo fibers were demonstrated uh, uh, in distance uh, suitable for short reach uh, optical interconnects typical for those uh, pluggable transceivers. Um, I'd like to uh, mention again, re-emphasize the uh, SR4.2, that's a BADA transceiver, used two wavelengths at 850 and 910 nanometer, and two wavelengths to double the, 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 the optical density. And here shows a linear array multicore fiber, and is preferred for silicon photonics to adapt linear transceiver arrays. And here it is the optical fiber properties, and this is well suited for 100 gig uh, is per second uh, bidirectional transmission uh, using like a PSM4, and it has potential for 400 gig bits per second of future 1.6 terabit communication links. And I'd like also point out for the circular design fiber, the, the core arranging circular. Um, there's also uh, techniques to, to uh, um, convert the circular to linear, um, to cut into a linear array of a transceiver. And I hand this over to Mabut. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Yi. Uh, so uh, Yi certainly covered uh, several fiber technologies uh, and fibers that are appropriate for the Kobo uh, consortium audience and for um, you know, high switch, high density switch interconnects. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of issues. The first one is hollow core fiber. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in the introductory slides. So uh, I'll do a quick animation here to get things rolling. So, uh, so uh, let me just speak to it and hopefully I can get through the next slide also. So, uh, the the holocore fiber um, uh, is basically designed so that the transmission guide is through an air core as opposed to a glass core, like regular single mode or multi-mode fiber. Uh, and essentially, because uh, light travels faster in air than if through glass, you get a significant latency advantage. It's specifically 1.54 microsecond per kilometer of fiber. Uh, so there's there's some real challenges in this. So the technology that's used for the OFS holocore fiber is photonic uh, band gap technology uh, that allows you to again transmit through air. So the silica or the glass forms a structure uh, that allows that air guide to um, carry forward without having issues with PMD, with MPI, with chromatic dispersion. With uh, it's naturally a few. Uh, mode fiber, and so you have to take care of the higher uh, mode orders, uh, attenuate that, and that's a lot of the engineering that's gone uh, on with this fiber. So the key of it was, it, the concept is about 20 years old, actually, there's almost 10 years of R&D behind it. As you mentioned, this is not as widely deployed as a standard single mode fiber or multi mode fiber, but it is commercialized. Um, in 2020, uh, OFS demonstrated uh, a cabled solution for 3.1 kilometer uh, over uh, for 10 gig uh, DWDM with uh, a very good BER performance uh, and showed that feasibility. The application has been uh, largest in the high performance computing where even nanoseconds or picoseconds of uh, latency matter. Uh, we're also looking at metro type applications and even submarine cable applications to look for much, much longer reach. But for a, from a Kobo perspective, we have gotten requests for as short as 20 centimeter type reaches. Currently the fiber, the commercial fiber is good for one meter or greater. So it would, it would work for jumpers or trunk cables, but it essentially offers the ultimate in terms of low latency for these applications. Okay, there it is. Um, so that was basically just showing an animation, the faster latency. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next topic, which is rollable ribbon. So this is a cable technology. Uh, and, and, and again, this is also actually about a 20 year old concept driven by NTT and several Japanese uh, manufacturers, including our parent company, uh, Furukawa. 
Uh, and what's shown here is basically the concept in this case is a 12 colored ribbon fiber uh, that's partially bonded. So instead of having a continuous bond, it's only intermittently bonded. So what that center um, diagram shows is that you can basically with hand pressure take that flat ribbon structure and roll it into a cylindrical shape. And that gives dramatic improvements in terms of packing density uh, and in terms of a small cable diameter. So it's a high density application. Again, it's been for more uh, within a data center for trunk type cables. It, it can be for inter data center and it's also for certainly much more longer haul or longer reach applications. Um, just as an example, for a one inch duct, you can double the density from a standard ribbon of 432 to 864. Uh, so it, it basically gives you a smaller footprint, which gives you a smaller uh, sort of carbon footprint also. It's a lighter cable. Uh, it's, it's been set up for uh, mash fusion splicing, uh, even though each manufacturer has a different approach. For the 250 micron fiber, a lot of those issues have been resolved even in terms of interoperability. And the next step is to go to 200 micron reduced sliding uh, rollable ribbon fiber. So uh, in terms of summary, again, I, I covered the low latency uh, hollow core fiber and the uh, high density rollable ribbon cable technologies. And with that, I'll actually go, uh, go back to Yi in terms of uh, finishing up the summary. And so, we, we mentioned at the beginning, you need a high density solutions. Um, Mabu just mentioned that a rollover ribbon, and then there are other approaches, uh, bending sensitive design and uh, uh, signal fiber, multiple fiber, and their waveless uh, multiplexing, uh, BIDA or SWDM, and uh, the thin fiber, reduced cladding, and uh, multiple fiber, that's uh, most future looking technology. And uh, for the reliability challenge, there is um, a way to uh, uh, improve that, uh, increase the 2% proof testing and reduce cladding design and um, uh, using high temperature coating. And for the optical performance, I highlighted with um, those examples um, with excellent uh, micro bending performance and um, uh, optimized for fiber design and the coating to improve the microbending and the tighter geometrical tolerance to uh, for the uh, less connector insertion loss and the cutoff option for cutoff control for less MPI. And also there is a, a bi refrigerance control to, to uh, improve the, the um, PR, the polarization extinction ratio. So that summarizes our presentation. All right. Very good. Well, first, I'd like to thank our, our presenters today. There's a lot of great information on those slides. They are very information rich slides. So um, as I said just a, a few moments ago, they will the slides will be available by the Kobo website. And this webcast will be available for, for people to um, review and share with their colleagues. That should be posted in about a week. Um, we just have a couple of minutes, um, I, I think, to, to wrap things up here. So I'd just like to ask you know, a couple of high-level questions, two high-level questions. First, Blunt, um, reliability was a key theme in your, in your presentations. And you know, when you look at the designs that are coming up, the CPO designs or onboard optic designs, uh, do you think that there's gonna be a lot of maintenance issues that um, data center operators will have to address in terms of cleaning and, and, and things like that? Or um, are these designs inherently you know, factory packaged so that there will be very little maintenance in these next gen switch designs? Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. So, uh, actually, I'm going to start from, uh, with, with the last statement that you made. I, I think it, they should be ma manufactured in the factory with those connectors, everything put uh, put in place, because we believe that would be it would be very difficult to actually, um, you know, allow technicians in the field in installation environments to sort of tamper with these, you know, the onboard connectors that they're. That in that, I mean, you remember the number of fibers that we're talking about in that, you know, one RU sort of switch unit. And, and we're talking about a very expensive switch ASIC, you know, equipment. And 
um, it, it, it would be it would be much better if th these are done in the factory and, and then the technicians in the field, when they're installing the structured cabling environment, they only deal with the, you know, the plane, the, the connector that goes to the plate of the, the, of the equipment, just like, like a pluggable, you know, pluggable equipment. The first part of your question, yes, I think definitely this is a um, like serviceability or reliability issue because these things of you can imagine they're gonna something's gonna go wrong and they need to be serviced. And um, uh, I, I I don't know if I mentioned this, but I I actually heard from a couple different uh, uh, you know um, people in the in the industry about how scarce we have uh, the, the, the 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 technicians that you know the exactly. the highly trained technicians in the field. And I mean this is I, I shouldn't say scarce, but there is a lack of highly trained technicians. Even exactly. without the you know co package optics or or more op optics type equipment, now when you include those, I think it will be even even worse. Exactly, um, the maintenance yeah. issues and reliability issues could yeah. very well become the data center operator's major problem. So, I think so. I agree. Yes. So, so I want to jump over to OFS uh, and uh, first a, a quick question from the audience: How many fibers can through a Kawa form into a linear array max? Uh, for this question, uh, we we like uh, we we are happy to hear um, what is the user case uh, requirement for the maximum I think, uh, linear yeah. array. Form? I think probably these switch designs that we've been talking about, where you have the the ASIC and then the um, co-packaged optics on the outside, and you're talking about hundreds, thousands, perhaps of fibers that need to be aggregated. Um, could those be put into that kind of linear array? I think the linear array, I'll bring this question to, to my uh, colleague who has more expertise on, on design this type of uh, um, fibers. And um, my own um, feeling of this, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it depends on, because the, the switches, um, they have a thousand uh, fibers or, or connectors, uh, ports over there, but uh, it actually, each one has a, you know, based on the 3.2 terabits or, or 400 gig or so you that would decide the maximum number of flow. Okay, and the one, one final question, and, and that's um, a, a similar one. When you look at that uh, switch design uh, of, you know, the ASIC and the CPO, and, and then um, you see how the fibers are coming out there, the, the bends that they have to do, um, would you, be considering that to be you know one of the high stress type environments where you would end up with some um, you know questions between the different fiber types, which one will be the most reliable? Or when when you see that type of design, um, it, it, is the fiber uh, connectivity challenge a difficult one in in your opinion, or is this is something the industry is solving? So for this, um, if I understand you well, mm -hmm. so where the the uh, high stress the bending is mm -hmm. for the fibers for the OBO and the CPO, mm -hmm. um, we know this OBO CBO is um, still very new, so there are different uh, uh, ways to handling from different uh, uh, manufacturers are uh, still in developing stage. And uh, the numbers I read from the COBO white papers, uh, like uh, 7.5 millimeter uh, bending radius that exit. And I heard some numbers like uh, if you have uh, the grating coupling from the top, from the top to the PIC, and then like a three millimeter radius. So those are all high stress part of the, uh, for the fiber and yeah. the reliability order. Yeah, Jim, I'll quickly add, uh, I think what you presented there, OFS does have an EC bend fiber in single mode that would meet those requirements on the single mode side. There's a lot of optimization on the multi-mode side also for bend optimized. It would be a challenge or something like a hollow core or for something like that, uh, meeting those sort of tight bend for a very short distance would be a challenge, but single mode and multi-mode are positioned for that. Mm -hmm. And then there, you know, I added, you know, there's uh, designs uh, newly developed to reduce the cladding diameter and uh, 
with increased proof test or to re and the high co high temperature coating optimize or to improve the reliability. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Well, with that, we've reached the top of the hour, so we're going to have to end our, our webcast at this time. But I want to thank everyone in uh, all of our three of our presenters. Um, excellent job. Lots of valuable information there. Contact information um, was provided in, in the presentation, so anyone in the audience who has further questions, please reach out directly to them. Um, I'd also like to thank Consortium for Onboard Optics for continuing this series, and uh, especially the DuPont Silicon Valley Technology Center uh, for, for your sponsorship. So thank you everyone for attending our webinar, and uh, we look forward to hearing more uh, from everyone in the future. Thank you.